Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Cases or Crisis Virtual Conference with Beyond Clean in partnership with CCI and sponsored by our generous conference sponsor, 3M. Our next speaker is a registered nurse and has worked for 18 years in the acute care settings, serving in various clinical and leadership capacities. Uh, and we'll be talking about um, the specific differences between inpatient care and ambulatory care settings. Uh, he's also the podcast host of the HealthMark podcast, Ask the Educator. Uh, and this program will help you, the attendees, solve the mystery of why are medical devices, why are they dirty or why are they non-functional? Uh, because whether you work at an ASC or in a hospital, the outcome must be the same, a clean and safe medical device for your patients. So with that, I am excited to hand it over to Kevin Anderson. Thank you so much, Lindsay, and thank you all for joining this uh, presentation today. And I hope you're enjoying the first two and, and the ones to follow as well. Hopefully you're signed up for those as well. But as Lindsay said, my name is Kevin Anderson, Clinical Education Coordinator at HealthMark. Just thank you for being here. The title is Ambulatory Surgery Centers are just like hospitals, aren't they? Before I get started, though, I just want to let you know that I have a handout of the presentation available if you prefer to print that out or save it for notes. There's also links to other educational materials there for you, like the podcast or other webinars. Uh, you probably saw that in advertisements leading up, but just want to make you aware of that. And there's also a group chat feature uh, on this presentation that I guess none of the other ones will have. You're welcome to use that. I will see it. Others will see it. You're welcome to try it out and just see what happens with it. Uh, it's new to me too, so uh, maybe we can all sort of figure that one out together. So just a quick disclosure though, I, before we get started, I am an employee of Healthmark Industries, which is a manufacturer and distributor of medical products. No compensation has been received uh, for this presentation. And of course, all opinions are those of myself, the presenter. Uh, this presentation is not meant to be used as a training guide or to replace an IFU for your medical device. You should always, always look out for those IFUs and heed them. Um, lastly, I just want to say, as I told Lindsay before we started, I am working from home. So uh, I apologize in advance if you hear any sort of noises. I have a dog. I have three kids. Stuff has happened. Uh, yesterday, I was telling her that one of my kids just decided to start practicing their instrument, so I had to quickly mute. So if that happens, I apologize, uh, and we'll get through it, I promise. Uh, so some objectives. Uh, we want to review the standards and guidelines applicable to the ambulatory surgery center setting. We want to understand the main cleaning equipment that is needed to provide a clean and functional medical device. And we want to discuss the use of a quality management system to ensure clean and functioning devices. Uh, that's the part I'm gonna be kind of really excited about and I'm gonna focus most of my time on. Part of that is just coming from my experience. In my experience, unfortunately, the ASCs that I'm familiar with, they did not have necessarily a very robust Q&A uh, process, QA, QMS, whatever you wanna uh, refer to it as. Um, so I'm really hopeful that there will be a lot of takeaways from this, and I hope that you're not overwhelmed with it. It's just, uh, and I'll mention it again at the end, is that it's just one step at a time adding uh, to your quality program over time. So let's get started. Absolutely, ambulatory surgery centers are different than acute care settings like the hospital. They may have different business models ranging from health system affiliations to standalone physician owned. They differ in reimbursement, case mix, and various other things. We all know that. However, ASCs are the same as hospitals in that the industry standards and guidelines, they all still apply. Accreditation agencies like the Joint Commission are gonna hold them to the same standards. And furthermore, the patients deserve the same level of quality and safety in that outpatient setting. A lot of times you'll find that they are uh, extremely happy to go to that outpatient setting. They get a great experience. The patient satisfaction scores were typically much, much higher there. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but we also wanna make sure uh, that the quality is where it needs to be. 
So if you're not familiar with ECRI, they are a nonprofit organization that serves the healthcare industry. My friend John Whalen describes them as being like the consumer reports of healthcare, and that's exactly the right description. Every year they provide some top 10 lists that we should be familiar with. And one of them is this top 10 patient safety concerns. Now, I don't expect you to be able to read the list there on the screen, but if you could see that fine print, you would see that the number five on the list is device cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization, which this probably shouldn't be news to us in all honesty in the device processing industry. We've seen our fair share of negative headlines over the years. This is just further proof that there are so many significant issues around device processing. ECRI also points out in this report that sterile processing failures can lead to surgical site infections, which have a 3% mortality rate and is also associated with an annual cost of $3.3 billion. So it's very costly from a, uh, a patient's health standpoint, and it's also an economic health concern for the health system as well. So does that really count for the ASC? Well, sure it does. Joint Commission released a report of all most challenging care standards specifically for the ASC. And number one was reducing the risk of infections associated with medical equipment, devices, and supplies. So again, they're in lockstep with ECRI, and we're going to see as we get further along, it all matters even in the ambulatory center. So just to kind of continue adding, adding on to this big picture for the ASC, we have been dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, which led to all kinds of surgical case cancellations. And now you know there's going to be a backlog of, for example, joint, uh, total joint revision surgeries or total joint replacement, I should say. And where we were already sort of in the process of switching over to the ASC before this pandemic hit. And now the demand is going to be even greater to possibly move total joint replacement surgeries into that ASC. And this is a good thing to be sure, but we have to be ready. In my experience, our ASC was unfortunately a bit of an island. It didn't get the proper attention. And in order to take uh, safely total joint replacement surgeries and the influx of patient volume that will continue to come for the foreseeable future, we need to have our ASCs ready to mitigate all those risks that are associated with device processing. Now, I know I sort of beat that to death, but I really wanted to set the stage for the meat of this presentation, which we're about to get into. Okay, so objective one, we wanna review the standards and guidelines applicable to the ASC. <clears throat> this is gonna be a poll question for you all, so I encourage you now you can go onto your screen and actually click whether or not at your facility we have the following standards or resources available to us. Amy ST79, Amy ST90, ST91. Do you have all of them available to you? And lastly, hopefully you're not asking yourself, what are the standards? We don't have any of these. So please, I encourage you to uh, submit your responses And I will just give you a little bit of time to do so. I see that answers are coming in. I'll wait just a little bit longer uh, and give you some time. Please don't be ashamed, uh, you know, if you don't have them, it's okay. Or even if you don't know, maybe you don't know that your facility has access to them. Uh, oftentimes, these kind of standards and guidelines they're only accessible by management, which I think is a good thing, but I also think it's better when they're available to the entire staff, right? And we all wanna be discussing them and have them available and know they're there. That would be the, uh, the ideal. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and move on with the answers that we have submitted. And I'm seeing, wow, a lot, 60% have all of these available. That's amazing. And then we have uh, another 30% that have 
only ST79, which is definitely a great start. We have a few that have ST90 and ST91, uh, which we're going to get into. And then there's a small percent there that maybe don't have them or maybe you don't know. And so I'm glad that you're here because I'm hoping that, you know, one of the takeaways for you guys will be to advocate getting these standards into your facility and getting your eyes on them, sharing them at meetings, things like that, getting to know them. So let's go. We have Amy ST79. Hopefully this one is just review, but this is where our industry standards and guidelines come from. This one is about steam sterilization specifically, and in this document it states, advances in medical, surgical, and dental practice have led to increased use of alternative healthcare sites like offices, ambulatory uh, care clinics, and similar clinical settings. Many such facilities use uh, tabletop steam sterilizers. So these office-based practices or ambulatory care settings, this uh, general concept is a comprehensive guide that apply to those settings. So again, ST79, it applies to you guys in the ambulatory care setting. Here's Amy ST90. This is a quality management system for processing in healthcare facilities. I'm glad that I know that there are a lot of you that may not have this and may not be familiar because quality management system is extremely important. And as we'll take a little more look into, our processes are filled with opportunity for failure. So a quality management system is extremely, extremely important. Amy ST91. Now this standard provides the guidelines uh, for flexible and semi-rigid endoscope processing. And for the purposes of this standard, it says healthcare facilities, meaning endoscopy centers, hospitals, nursing homes, extended care facilities, freestanding surgical centers, uh, ambulatory health centers like clinics. So all of these areas are encompassed in this standard as well. Now, I will just warn you, this is not going to cover endoscopy only because endoscopy is a huge standalone topic in and of itself. Uh, so we are going to focus mostly on, you know, sterilization side of things and cleaning, of course, because that's foundational. And then there's the AORN. This is a great resource that also includes special considerations for the ASC when applicable. Later, we're going to talk about quality management. Here's what AORN guideline has to say regarding QMS and device processing. So the healthcare organization's quality management program should evaluate the cleaning, decontamination, and care of instruments. A quality management program should include monitoring of manual and mechanical cleaning. Okay, so now you're seeing the con continuous and consistency of this, whether it's from our ECRI list, our joint commission list, our industry standards, we know that we need to do this. We need to have this quality management program. The one thing with AORN standards, maybe if you're a device processor, you're not as familiar with AORN, but a lot of times nurses are the ones that your department reports up to, especially in the ASC. So maybe they're speaking more of an AORN language. And so this is gonna be sort of your go-to and how you show them that, hey, we need to do this and we have a lot of work to do in order to develop this QMS program. And then this hopefully is an obvious one, but no matter where you process devices, the IFU must be followed, right? Uh, hopefully they're not as difficult as tying a tie. Okay, so here's, we, we have another poll question for you. Okay, so get ready to click on your answer. At our facility, we re reference industry standards and guidelines and IFUs routinely. Do you strongly disagree, disagree? Are you kind of like neutral? You're not really sure. Do you agree with that or do you strongly agree? And I'm gonna give you a little bit of time to answer that. You know, you can give some thought to it uh, because maybe personally you do but the rest of your department doesn't. IFUs are tricky. A lot of times we have one source available to us where we can just go on and search up uh, the IFU that we need, but it does take time and it takes intention, right? 
because what we normally do is we know that it takes time. So sometimes we may kind of bypass that or ask our manager or somebody else to do it for us. Um, so we want to make sure that we know what we're doing with a device, especially when we're looking at loaners and consignments and the potential for bringing on total joint replacement, things like that. Eye instruments, right? Some of you guys might be doing eye cases. So it's very important that we have those IFUs and standards and guidelines that we're referencing, especially when we run into questions. It looks like we got a pretty good uh, amount of respondents. So I'm going to go ahead and look at the results now. And it looks like, wow, again, many of you are either in the agree or strongly agree section there. So uh, kudos to you all. If you couldn't answer uh, agree or strongly agree, I hope that, you know, somewhere in any of these presentations, whether it's mine or someone else's, uh, you'll be inspired to to get into those and learn more and use them as constant refer uh, references in your uh, practice. So moving on to objective two, we want to understand the main cleaning equipment that is needed to provide a clean and functional medical device. So it may be a stretch to label these products as cleaning equipment. However, they are essential to the cleaning process, and therefore I decided to include these items in this section. Point of use care of instruments is foundational to the cleaning of reusable medical devices. So pretreatment products, transportation and labeling products, they're all important pieces of equipment to have for the processing cycle of these reusable devices. In the ASC setting, you may not have case carts, you may not have certain things that they do at the hospital. That means we have to do things maybe a little bit differently, but we have to do them. Point of use care, transportation, there's a lot of OSHA guidelines around that, a lot of industry standards, a lot of safety measures. We got to get it right, and that's going to set the stage for our the rest of our cleaning process. So the manual cleaning area, does your sink have the correct number of basins? Does it have the correct detergents and dosing systems? And what about the source for critical water? And we can't forget about brushes or inspection tools and other necessary items, right? You might laugh because some of this picture that you see over here, it's probably most likely in a hospital setting. And maybe your decontam at an ASC is like the size of a closet. Well, that's a problem, right? You need adequate space as well to do your uh, decontam duties. You need the right space, you need the right air exchanges, you need the right pressure, air pressure. You need all of those things to do it right. Now, automated equipment is critical to our cleaning procedures. It represents an automated, repeatable way to clean a large volume of instruments, and every ASC must have some version of an automated washer or an ultrasonic cleaner I would recommend two of each, at least, for redundancy's sake when failures occur, because they do occur. And if you can't have two, what's your backup plan if one goes down? For us, we were, um, we were both fortunate and unfortunate because the ASC that was tied to our facility was logistically pretty far away. It wasn't right next door, okay? So when something happened at their facility and they needed to bring it over to our main hub at the local uh, acute care setting. It required a lot of time constraints and a lot of planning and logistics and all of that. But you have to do it. You have to have that backup plan in case your automated cleaner or your ultrasonic goes down. Again, ultrasonic cleaning is mandated by certain IFUs. So what are you gonna do when it goes down, right? So we have to have those backup plans in place. So moving on, manual and automated cleaning processes are great when they work, right? But both machines and people are subject to failing. And these 10 factors that you see are all various ways that the cleaning process can fail, right? We have standards and guidelines. If you don't have them, you're not aware of them, they're not built into your process, they can affect the quality of our cleaning process. Okay. Then there's instructions for use, same thing, right? If you don't have them available, you don't have the knowledge or training or 
uh, maybe the IFU itself is outdated and it doesn't give you adequate instruction, right? That happens. Um, that can be an issue. The type of soil, is it blood? Is it synovial fluid? Whatever. All those things make a difference. Temperature, chemical activity of your uh, detergents and dilution concentration of that detergent. And the, there's a human factor, of course, that's always an issue, right? And then there's the mechanical, whether it's manual or automated. So there's a lot of different ways that we can go wrong uh, in our cleaning process. Which brings us to the objective number three. Um, this is meant to be, remember, a broad overview. There's a lot to cover, and many of these could have presentations of their own. So this is meant to get you acquainted with all of the different components that should be a part of your quality management system, even in an ASC. And remember, you know, don't overwhelm yourself when you're implementing these things, uh, but you should be chipping away. You should be growing your QMS program. So if you're going to do total joint replacement at your facility, or even if you're not, uh, you better get working on your point of use care, right? Again, this is the foundation to your success when it comes to processing reusable devices. So even if you're not doing those uh, joint replacement surgeries, and if you do, you're gonna see why this is all very important because you'll see as the picture on that left illustrates, oftentimes this is the, what the instruments look like when they come from the OR and they haven't done point of use care adequately. That picture on the right, I hope it's uh, almost hard for you to tell, but that's actually in decontam that came straight from the OR. It's the same device, same set of devices, and they actually cleaned it so much, it almost looks like it's already been through the cleaning process. So how are you going to get your partners in the OR to perform that level of point of use care like they're supposed to? Because there are ways, right? You're going to need to audit, all right? You need to include audit scores in your goals, in your performance reviews. Everyone needs to understand how important this step is and that it is not optional. If you don't think you have the resources to pull it off, then you got to go and get them. Advocate for them. I know it's not easy, but it is a part of a, as a part of a health system, you might have access to quality people or infection preventionists. They can all help you. The OR manager can help you. This is all a part of the team's responsibility around surgical services. You don't have to feel like you're alone in this, right? And I know we all have competing priorities, but you have to advocate for your department and for the resources that you need. But what you see here on the screen is a very simple audit form. This could be done whether you have electronic instrument tracking or you're doing it the old school way with paper and pencil, right? And you just audit whatever you want. You can change this, it's fluid. It, uh, if you start to see instruments coming down and they're in the clamp position or they're not disassembled or they're grossly soiled, you're documenting this stuff. And then you develop report cards based on this data and you uh, put it on quality boards and you huddle around this information, right? This is very important. Uh, one of the things that's nice about these is it gives people objective data about their performance. Many times we think in the operating room, I was a former OR nurse, right? I'm a rock star. I do everything right. But if someone were to do audits on my case carts, I guarantee you they wouldn't have always been great. You know, it wasn't really until I got into sterile processing where I realized how bad I probably was and how much better I should have been, okay? So we need to teach all those uh, youngsters like I once was in the OR how to do it the right way. So we mentioned this a bit when we talked about the sink, but water quality is important to cleaning the, the cleaning process. And a question to ask yourself is, do you even have a critical water source? Is it working? And has it been maintained if you do? When I started as a manager of SPD, our critical water source, which was a DI system, which is great, it hadn't been maintained in years. It was not functional. Critical water is important for maintaining the life of your instrument assets and rinsing off impurities, 
So make sure that you have that system in place and that it is being maintained. And also, are you checking your water routinely for pH and hardness and alkalinity? pH is important as this can affect your detergent effectiveness or the life of your instruments and lead to pitting. Hardness is important too. If your water is hard, it requires more detergent than normal to work effectively. It can also leave scaling in your washers or on the instruments themselves. And then you have alkalinity. It's a measure of how well, well your water can buffer the changes that uh, happen to your water. So this is also an important thing to measure. And so maybe you're going to check your water daily or maybe weekly or monthly and so on. As long as your water looks good, maybe you're pushing it out at longer increments. But you need to establish that baseline so that you can identify variances and understand why there might be issues going on because there's all kinds of external things that could impact your water quality. So quality tests for your ultrasonic cleaner, okay? Again, this is a critical piece of equipment for us. We need to test for cavitation and the cleaning, but also if your uh, machine allows for it, the lumen cleaning side. So you might be running three tests in your ultrasonic cleaner. Cavitation is the cleaning energy that is produced from your ultrasonic. That's what it's designed to do. It's unique to the ultrasonic and provides cleaning of all those hard to reach spaces within a complex device. However, cavitation energy can be reduced if the transducers are shut off or they're broken, or maybe they're just too far from the device within the basin, right? Therefore, cavitation should be checked on your ultrasonic every day that it's in use. It is also good to make sure that the sonic is actually removing soil and flushing and removing soil from those lumen items if you're using it for that. So for that, you can run simple soil removal tests. Again, each day that, it in, that it's in use is best. And I'll show you these tests right here. Here is what they might look like. These are not the only tests, but these are uh, examples of tests. You have soil removal test on the left. That's a, just a stainless steel coupon with a with a similar um, soil is what you're going to see uh, on your instruments, and it's just testing that it's being removed, right? So you have another soil removal test for your lumen items. So in the middle, you'll see a soil removal coupon that goes inside of a lumen, lumen because that lumen flushing is different than what's going on in the rest of your ultrasonic bath. So these tests are gonna help you understand how to proceed if there are problems. And you have that cavitation test on the right. This is gonna change from that green to that bright yellow you see on the right. That's gonna help you understand if all of your transducers are working or if all the different areas in your ultrasonic bath are receiving that cavitation energy. So these tests, like I said, they're going to be a barometer for you uh, to make decisions and to know when things are working and when they're not. So, for example, if my cavitation test passes and my soil removal test passes, but my lumen soil test fails, then I know that I will need to call for service, but I could probably still use the cleaner for a non-lumened item, right? Maybe I can't hook up my MIS instruments anymore, but... That doesn't mean that all functionality and all usefulness is gone. But over time, you start to learn these various problems that arise and what causes the failures, and you become better acquainted with the equipment and better equipped to solve the problem as well. So it helps you with your clinical decision making, and it helps you to get more uh, aware of what is going on with your equipment as well. So automated washers. They also need quality tests every day they're in use. They should be tested for soil removal, just like that Sonic. But they may also need testing for lumen soil removal if you're using it that way. I, you know, in an ASC setting, maybe you are, maybe you aren't. Depends on the age of your equipment or if you have all those different accessories. So some of them, some facilities may have those washers with that capability. But that's something that you have to figure out with your own equipment. Um, Another thing that's important with automated washers is water temperature. Remember, we want cooler water in the initial stages for that initial rinse. We want water to be within a range for the detergent IFU when the cycle is using the detergent. 
and then we want a high water temperature to achieve that low level thermal disinfection uh, closer to the end before the drying begins, right? So here are the ways that you can test those components. You have a data logger on the left. This one, uh, I'll go into a little bit more on the next slide because I was less familiar with it. So I'm just gonna assume that you're not as familiar with it. Um, but it provides you a report and I'll show you that report on the next slide. And then you have that soil removal test again in the middle. Remember, we use this in the Sonic as well. And again, you have a washer that flushes lumens, then you have to test that as well. But uh, most of us are gonna use at least that test in the middle uh, to test our washers. A little bit more about that data logger and uh, temperature monitoring. This is just a, a, a way that you can do it. You just put that little device that you see on the right inside of your washer and it will track the changes in temperature throughout your cycle. And you can see, hopefully you can see, it's hard, it might be a little bit difficult to see that picture on the left. It's a basically of a report, but you can see that line of temperature is starting lower and then it goes higher for that uh, thermal disinfection stage and then it starts to go low again in the drying stage. So um, that's just kind of an example of what you can get with a simple device like that. And again, you may, this may be something you decide to do daily that it's in use or weekly, whatever, periodically, but you establish that baseline and it helps you maybe if you start have a problem where your washer stops passing the soil removal test, then maybe you can start checking, all right, will the temperatures be the right, uh, you know, be in the right range, that kind of thing. You start checking boxes off of what could be the potential problem. So uh, great device for that. Now, in an ASC setting, you may or may not have a cart washer. However, if you do, you should be checking to make sure that it's working just like an instrument washer. It too can fail. This simple test is used to show that water impingement is reaching those hard to reach areas within your case carts, right? Because uh, you have that inside part that we wanna make sure uh, so that the water is reaching it. So that little black square that you see on the test will turn white if the water is in fact reaching it. And then it can also show you what temperature your washer water reached during the cycle. Because again, if we're going for that low level thermal disinfection, you want that 180 degree box to turn from white to black, all right? So these simple tests can be placed on challenging parts in your case cart or whatever item it is you're washing in your cart washer, and it can show you that the water washer is doing its job. Now, this is an example of a simple cleaning verification test. There are several types, and they're used for checking challenging items to be cleaned, whether they're uh, you know, cleaned in an automated washer or by hand. This particular test will show the presence of hemoglobin. You can see on the picture on the right that shows that box lock. It turned positive on the test because there was a presence of hemoglobin, and this should indicate that that instrument will need to go back for a repeat cleaning. It should not go on to the prep and pack and sterilization part, right? So this would help help us to see sometimes soils that exist that maybe are not easy to see with the unaided eye. Uh, and it can confirm, you know, sometimes we're looking at staining or different things. And we want to test to make sure that that isn't actually blood, in this case, hemoglobin. So those are just some examples. Remember, you can get protein tests, you can get hemoglobin tests, ATP, they're all part of that sort of line of cleaning verification. So enhanced visual inspection. I know this may seem weird to include as a part of a quality management system, but I hope you'll understand why I put it in here. Number one is that there are times when enhanced visual inspection is required by an IFU. For example, Da Vinci requires four times magnification for inspection of their endo wrist instruments. You may not be doing Da Vinci cases at your ASC, but it is not unusual to see this requirement in other IFUs as well. And secondly, magnification tools that can take photographs, like the two on the left of the screen, can be useful for documenting your photographic evidence of either problematic instruments and or instruments that were adequately cleaned and free of defect or bio burden, right, prior to sterilization. So this could be 
uh, a check for you to say that, yep, there was no visual problem with this instrument. And then if there is a problem, then it becomes a photograph that you can use for uh, learning and education and giving to your instrument repair vendor, things like that. Um, so it's uh, very important to have an enhanced visual inspection. If you're not doing Da Vinci, most likely you're doing orthopedic cases, arthroscopy cases specifically. And shavers are an example of a common item used in an ASC. We typically do lots of arthroscopic mm. surgical procedures in the ASC. Most shavers, IFU, are going to call for direct visual inspection of the inside of the channels of the shaver. So tools like the bore scope that you see on the left are now necessary. You'll understand why when I go to the next slide. Here you have the inside of the shaver that we've showed you on the previous slide. Areas that are difficult, if not impossible, to see without the use of a bore scope. And now, as you can see, the shavers in these pictures are dirty. This was discovered because in the past there have been SSIs traced back to arthroscopic procedures. And then it was discovered that the shavers, just like you see here, were the culprit. We have done audits of ready for use shavers for facilities that did not have a bore scope and found a, a staggering amount of these shavers are either visibly dirty inside and test positive for the presence of either blood or protein. And unfortunately, it's all too common. This happens partly because you don't have the bore scope to inspect them, but it also can happen because you don't have the correct brushes to clean the device both are critically important. And one last thing that could also happen is you have the tools you need and then you don't use them accordingly. Or you have one staff member that doesn't want to waste the time. They're more concerned about going fast and getting great turnarounds, right? So we want to make sure that we have the stuff that we need to do the job right and that we're using it accordingly. Electrical leak testing or insulation testing. This is a critical step in the safe processing of laparoscopic instruments or any insulation coated instruments, right? So laparoscopic instruments may be the most common, but there are many types of instruments that are coated with insulation. And when I learned about insulation testing as a new manager of SPD, I was shocked when I discovered that we only had one tester and it was buried in a pile not being used at all. And I, pardon my pun, I didn't mean to make the pun, but uh, <laughs> anyway, this is an absolute must have, okay? Uh, and I'm gonna show you why. It's a must have because number one, again, it's required by IFUs, but also because there is a significant risk to the patient should they get burned by a stray electrical current leaving a compromised area of an instrument. If you look at the picture on the, on the right, the main white area there that's sort of lit up, that is highlighted, that's typically what the surgeon's view is. He's looking at the area that he is trying to dissect or cauterize. If you look at that part uh, circled to the right in orange, you can see the stray electrical current leaving the instrument in the shadowed area that may or may not be in his line of view. And that area that he can't see, there's an electrical leak and it can cause trauma to the patient's adjacent organs. And those electrical leak testers are another must have for your quality management system because of this. This should be done every insulated instrument every time. A good, good idea would be to include a checkbox for this step in your documentation. Uh, but again, you'll, you'll be surprised if you have not used these in your facility and then you start using it, you're gonna find a lot of instruments unfortunately that are compromised and that could have led to a problem with one of your patients. And people may not even know that's the worst thing about it. They could have a complication with the surgery and never realize that this was the reason why. So get these in your facility, uh, whether it's this version or another version, you need to be competent in doing this every single time. Now, one of our more frustrating things, if you've ever worked in the OR, is getting a set of instruments or a peel pouch item and the discovering that the pouch seal is open or compromised mm -hmm. in some way. And this is one thing that often is a bit of an afterthought when it comes to quality checks. But the problem with peel pouches does happen. 
they do uh, lead to delays in cases or potentially an IUSS if it, if it is a one-of-a-kind item. So it's a good idea to check the seal integrity of your pouches. Maybe you're doing self-sealed pouches. You can still do a seal integrity test to make sure your people are sealing those correctly. But as you can see on the picture, um, there's a you're using an automated sealer in this case. In the picture on the left, it shows uh, you just put that little test on the inside. You run it through your sealer, and you can... Uh, punch the ink out in that picture on the right hopefully you can tell but there's a little bit of blue ink uh, leaking through the seal that should not happen you should have a continuous seal with no compromises no leaks and this will help you to identify any problems with your sealing device so a failed uh, test like this may indicate that you need some servicing or or whatever another plan or of action uh, more education whatever it is it's a good indicator that something needs to be done. Sterilization, hopefully this one will be the most obvious and familiar components. You see BI incubators there, a Bowie Dick test. Uh, those we're gonna run daily. The BI is minimally daily and with implant loads. However, <clears throat> at my former facility, we went to every load BI monitoring. I believe that's the best practice and it makes for easier recalls should anything happen, right? And in the picture, of the cart with the sets on it. Uh, you're not gonna see all the little details in there, but uh, it's just a reminder. You know, you should be checking uh, for indicator tape, locks, labeling, et cetera, all those items. When, the, when those things are going into the sterilizer, you're checking. And again, uh, when they're coming out or going to storage or going to the OR, because we have change of staff or whatever, or sometimes even the sterilizer knocks off our labeling or whatever. So always be checking for these every single time you're taking items in or out of a sterilizer. So ready for use items, okay? End user audits or surveillance audits where you're uh, checking your items before the OR even uses them, they're, it's a great idea and should be part of your quality management process. You see an example there of a simple form that was printed with every pick sheet for every case at my former facility. It was an easy way for them to quickly report any defects with our trays. The key here is that you don't make piles of these reports and never look at them. These are like gold, okay? They tell you what the problems really are. You may have an idea, but these are the reports coming from your end users. You can track and trend what problems arise and therefore adjust your plan of attack. And maybe you need to target education to your team about an instrument that needs to be disassembled prior to sterilization. Maybe you have one tech that keeps making the same mistake. These reports allow you to manage that quality. Remember, you're tracking and trending. You have data that shows you how well your team is performing, and you can speak to that when physicians' concerns arise or things like that. It's, a, it's a, an amazing way to do it. And again, you don't need fancy instrument tracking to do so. You can use paper and pen and maybe an Excel worksheet or whatever. There are many ways to do this kind of thing and really get a lot of value out of it. So... Immediate use steam sterilization, it feels like this topic has been around forever, and there are many places that have done a very good job reducing IUSS to almost nothing. And however, I believe that ASCs are often over-reliant on IUSS. It happens for many reasons. Um, you know, they might not have as many instrument sets or they're focusing on turnarounds and things like that, but there are very little justifications for IUSS within the standards. AORN, Amy, they all agree that IUSS should not be done because there is insufficient inventory. That's not an excuse, right? It should not be done uh, unless those items that you're planning to do an IUSS on have it written in the instructions for use that you can actually do it. So be sure to check those IFUs before you decide to IUSS an item. I think you might be surprised there's a lot less items with IUSS in their IFUs. Sorry, there's a lot of acronyms there. Uh, but there's a lot less items with those instructions uh, than you would imagine. So check those out. Track and trend your IUSS. Devel develop a plan to reduce or eliminate that 
from your process. I assure you it can be done. We did it at our facility. And then we even had it throughout our whole health system at major acute care hospitals in, in our region. We're able to reduce significantly or eliminate altogether the use of IUSS. It can be done. Um, you just have to be intentional about it. And I'll just quickly plug that there is a thing that uh, Beyond Clean is doing next week, talking uh, to this um, IUSS uh, topic. So check that out. I'm sure you can find it on their website or LinkedIn. So uh, join that conversation if you want to know more about it. Um, here is an important step in a QMS is documentation. If you're doing quality management steps and forget to document them, then you are doing yourself a huge disservice. And we have a saying is in, in nursing that if you didn't document it, it wasn't done. And that is so true. If surveyors look and they ask you if you're doing something and you can't show the documentation, they're not going to be trusting that you're doing it. So you always have to figure out uh, how you're going to document who's doing who's doing it, uh, what are they doing, when are they doing it, how are they doing it, what are the results, what did you do based on those results. Those are kinds of things that you're always going to need in your documentation for a QMS. All right, so we have another poll question for you. So at our facility, we have a robust quality program. Do you strongly agree? Do you dis or strongly disagree? Do you disagree just a little bit? Are you neutral on the subject? Do you agree? Uh, do you strongly agree with that uh, setup? Uh, so please take some time, check out this poll question. Uh, submit your answers. I'm going to give you a little bit of time uh, to, to get your answers in. And I'm just watching right now as they come in how many are being submitted. Uh, at this time, I'll check this uh, little group chat here. A lot of us working from home. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Um, let's see. Nevler. Good evening from KSA. All right. Good evening to you. And thank you for joining us. All right, so we have a pretty good amount of respondents. Uh, do you guys, let's see, we're going to go and check the results here. All right. So most of you, it looks like, agree or strongly agree. That's over half. And then the rest of the half of you are somewhere in the neutral to strongly disagree uh, part. So, that gives me some encouragement, obviously, to see people feeling that strongly that they're doing a great job with the quality. But as you can see from our poll, there's a lot of opportunity out there at, at, at facilities to up their game. And that's OK. The point is, obviously, to start somewhere and keep it going and never stop improving, right? So quality and sterile processing at an ASC or a hospital should be top of mind. Quality data, metrics, KPIs, whatever you wanna call them, they should be shared at system infection control committees, surgical service committees, quality and safety committees, and anywhere else that makes sense within your organization. You might ask yourself why, and we're gonna get to that, and, uh, you know, and couldn't these sort of things, if they're reported, couldn't they be used against me, right? Uh, couldn't people think that we're doing terrible? Well, the opposite of that, actually, is they're going to know that you know what's going on in your department, and they're also going to know that you're working on your quality and trying to get it better. So uh, please continue to work on it and report it at all the, um, uh, the places that should be and have... Uh, you want to broadcast it because eventually, even if you're struggling with the quality, you're going to get to a point where it improves and you're going to be proud of your work and you want to be it, have it built into this reporting structure in your facility or within your health system. So another reason as to why is accountability is important. And if you're going to have accountability for your team or your vendors, right, because vendors come into play with loaners and consignment and management and having actual meaningful data will help hold all the stakeholders accountable. Accountability is not a bad thing. We think a bit too much is just punitive. It's not just a punitive thing. This is to help us learn and grow and get better. It's much bigger than just trying to get people in trouble. That's not what it's meant to be. 
So you start to learn also what causes your failures. You start to understand how to investigate and solve those problems that could potentially lead to consequences for patients under the care of your team. You become better equipped to collaborate, share lessons learned, and build up your sterile processing team through education. Or maybe you can help the sterile processing department elsewhere in your system to solve a critical problem that maybe you have already experienced and fixed, right? Or maybe you share your findings and lessons learned on social media and somewhere on the other side of the world, someone is able to benefit. Maybe the entire industry is elevated because of your efforts. I mean, imagine that. Maybe one of your own loved ones ends up needing your facility service, right? And maybe you'll rest a little easier knowing that they will get the highest quality of instruments available. I apologize. I'm getting a, <clears throat> a little emotional, but this is a picture of my daughter waiting in the ER. We knew she needed surgery, and the first thing that I thought about was her risk for infection, right? You can have the best doctors in the world, but a compromised set of instruments can lead to a life-altering complication. Thankfully, this procedure required only percutaneous pins, and she did great without complication. But when it's your child, your loved one, it all matters. It's all a big deal. They, they go directly into the bone. It's a portal of entry for contaminants. You want to get it right every time, right? That's what we do this for. So remember, there is a more robust QMS for an ASC than what I've shared here. Considerations for endoscopy, eyes, robotic. The, they could be entire presentations on their own. So don't stop with what you've seen here. It is best to get started with your QMS and continuously add to it to make it as comprehensive as it needs to be, right? That's what we want. I know I just spent a lot of time on how ASCs require the same level of quality management as a hospital when it comes to reusable device processing, but I know there are unique challenges. Often the ASC stands as a silo, right? Even within a major health system, many times they're forgotten when it comes to preventive maintenance, contracts or services. They also miss out on education opportunities or adequate competency training. Many times the leader of SPD in an ASC is an OR nurse manager that doesn't necessarily know sterile processing. I can say that because I am a nurse, I have my CNOR, which is a fantastic program. Don't get me wrong. It gives you great introduction to sterile processing. However, it does not equip you to be the expert in sterile processing. There are all real life challenges and barriers to managing quality and device processing in an ASC, but they do not acquit us from doing the right thing by our patients. And in that regard, we are held to the same standard as our peers in the hospital and rightfully so. So thank you all for your time. I hope that you got a lot out of this presentation. If we have time, uh, Lindsay, we can uh, answer questions that people have. Um, it looks like uh, there's not a ton of activity in the group chat, but thank you all for your comments and, and, and little things that you did send. And uh, I appreciate your presence and, and interacting here. Oh, I see somebody from the Philippines. Thank you uh, so much for being here. Um, but yeah, Lindsay. Do we got any time or do we have any questions that we want to address before we wrap up? Yes, we have time and we have questions. So this is okay. great. Yes, All right. First and foremost, thank you so much for providing such important information um, about patient safety, about medical device reprocessing, regardless of the setting, but specifically yeah. in the ASCs. Um, My pleasure. Certainly appreciated. Uh, a couple of great questions have come through. Uh, let's see. A couple of comments as well. If only every person would think that way who works in sterile processing. Kevin, do you have any suggestions or ideas on encouraging commitment and devotion to the career? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, well, I can say 
remember we all have our span of influence we whether you're a manager um a, a lead it almost doesn't matter we're all leaders whether it's informal or formal and you can choose um to share that sort of perspective with your peers you can have something that i liked was having different signs up in the department to be a visual reminder another thing is just sharing stories from the OR of people that have done well because of our services. But it's one of those things, again, you have to be intentional about it. You have to have dialogue about it because we're not robots. We're human beings. We come in uh, from our homes with uh, various challenges that, that, that take our minds off the goal at hand. And we got to stop pretending that we're robotic because we're not. So we have to be intentional. We have to be thinking about it and talking about it as a team all the time. That would be my suggestion. I know it's hard to um, sort of do that in the hustle and bustle, but we have to be creative sometimes and do that, build it into our huddles. Uh, I recommend daily huddles because if you do one once a week, um, it tends to end up being you need like an hour. If you do them every day, you could maybe get through some things in five, 10 minutes and, and have some meaningful discussions and sort of reorient the entire group to the mission at hand. So that would be, I guess, my practi one practical tip that I would offer. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, the next question that came through, uh, we don't have a cart washer at our ASC, just curious of processes others use to make sure their caskets and carts are getting cleaned appropriately. Yeah, I think um, when it comes to, I love that you use the term caskets. Oh man, uh, that's a great one, but I know what you're talking about. So a lot of times at our facility, say even people who have case carts, they break down too, right? So a lot of times you come up with um, a solution where you're using a different sort of rack and putting it through your automated washer that will accommodate for those uh, caskets or, uh, you know, what what else do we refer to? There's so many different things, but you can put them in your automated washer. But again, you're going to have to defer to the IFUs if you have to go about it in a manual uh, way. You're going to have to really dissect those IFUs and make sure whatever your process is, that it's consistent with what's recommended by that manufacturer. Okay. Next question. Does a document exist for guidance on pretreatment for lumens and cannulated items at point of use? Um, yeah, I, I would say so. I think that when, you know, you're asking for a pretty level of specificity there. Um, but if you look at the IFUs for those cannulated instruments, normally there is a section in there dedicated to point of use care of those. Um, if it's not and it's an older sort of IFU that hasn't been updated, then refer to your guidelines and standards because they're always going to support the point of use care of instruments. And I will tell you, as a former nurse, I didn't get that training, but your scrub techs, they know. If they went through a formal program, they know that their the industry standards and the IFUs and just the flat out right thing to do is to take care of those instruments at the point of use. But yes, there is documentation, whether it's IFU or industry guidelines and AORN, Amy, they all support that point of use care. It's that specificity that you asked about. Hopefully that's in there, but it definitely matters. And I'm glad that you addressed that. That's a good question. Thank you. Uh, this next question has to do with, I think, the proximity that sometimes, for better or for worse, leads to convenience in an ASC setting. This question says, is it okay to bring instruments right after use and open carry across hall directly to the dirty room and clean instead of spray and cover? Oh, <laughs> oh gosh. It sounds like you already know the answer uh, to <laughs> that. Uh, but I appreciate the question nonetheless um, because that is a real life circumstance and one of those ones that is uh uh it's an easy pitfall to fall into and even the best of employees will succumb to that uh on occasion so um the answer is no like you you really need 
to follow the rules and regulations and policies, procedures, IFUs, all that stuff, OSHA guidelines. Remember, when it comes to transporting uh, contaminated items, that's federal law, that's OSHA that's telling us we need to contain these things, we need to label them, and then you have to, the pre-treatment and all of that, that's more the IFU and industry standards, but yes, you got you got to do them, even in that, that close proximity um, circumstance. So good question again, I love it. All right, and we do have time for one more question. Uh, I need some help developing a quality management program, including a cleaning verification requirement for most mm. specifically our flexible endoscopes. Any suggestions uh, as I'm in charge of monitoring this process as an extension of infection control, uh, a new ed sterilization educator? Please advise. Uh, well, that's a great question, and I wish that, um, you know, we had my entire panel of of our team our educator team because we have a lot of endoscopy uh specialists on, that could help you big time in this realm but just to sort of get you started okay if this isn't an asc setting uh like i'm assuming maybe you're not doing um duodenoscopes like you would in at a hospital but if you are i would just prioritize doing cleaning verification on duodenoscopes or you're more your most complex endoscope and start with that and build your program out from there, right? The, the Remember what uh, we want to do is we want to start somewhere and build it up. So get comfortable uh, teaching your team and learning yourself the process for cleaning verification and decide what product. So you got to do some, um, you know, some research on what product you want to do, uh, whether it's protein or some sort of flush or an ATP, whatever. There, there are a lot of items out there for endoscopes, and it's a great question, but do your research, pick a product, uh, figure out um, your process around it, how you want to do it, your frequency, all of that stuff. Start with your most complex device and get the process uh, sort of documented and then you can turn it into a procedure slash policy from there. And then you can grow it from there. You can start to add uh, whether it's frequency or you can add it out to your EGDs and colonoscopes or whatever. Um, but that's sort of, I mean, I wish I had more time to go more in depth with this. I apologize. I hope that got you a little bit started. Uh, please feel free to send those questions uh, into uh, an email as well so that we can sort of address it even in more in depth, I guess I would say, because I don't want you to feel lost here. We want to support you starting that. That's a great idea. And um, we want to give you all the help we can with that. Great. And everyone else who asked questions, thank you so much. I will be providing those questions to Kevin and he can reach out to you directly via email. That is all the time we have. Kevin, thank you so much for being a part Welcome. of this conference. And clearly there's a need to have you back again to continue this discussion. <laughs> so, so we'll I know, talk yeah. about Thank that offline. Thank you offline. for having me. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. Everyone will see you again in about 15 minutes. All right. Thank you all.